Don't say the old lady scream, bring her on and let her scream. That is the sage and strategic advice from one of the masters of persuasive storytelling, Mark Twain. Twain's words are profoundly on Mark and could be an informal mantra for how lawyers should prepare their case presentations. Twain's calls for show don't tell is a winning strategy to help convey an opening statement to tell a story to a jury. People actually remember things best in story format, but not just any story, it has to be told right. There can't be too many details or the story structure gets lost. Every sentence has to move the story forward in time, otherwise you're telling details, not a story. It must move chronologically. We all connect to stories, especially ones that involve good versus evil and that remind us of our shared histories. We especially want the good, often the underdog, to beat the bad. The battle that often rages in civil court is the money-seeking, unworthy plaintiff against the uncaring defendants who will not admit the wrong they have caused. And without a good story, jurors have nothing to grasp hold of. In this insider exclusive special, we go behind the headlines of some of America's most important publicized trials to share 10 of the most successful trial rules used by successful lawyers to win their cases in winning jury verdicts with the power of stories. And as our special guest today, we are honored to visit with Bob Polkey, partner at Robert Polkey Law Group and past president of the Nebraska Association of Trial Attorneys to discuss some of his cases and how he has successfully used these proven 10 trial rules in the courtroom. Stories are about people. This is rule number one for a reason. Lawyers often get lost in law and details and lose sight of the people that make their case have meaning. Anytime a lawyer can get beyond the mere facts of the case and get to the story behind the case, they are doing a great service to their client. Rule number two, let your characters speak for themselves. While a true storyteller can create drama and interest by developing a compelling story and revealing facts along the way, it's much harder for a lawyer who really has to lay out the facts in a more direct way. However, the use of visuals such as animations, graphics, video, storyboards, and timelines can go a long way towards creating interest where boredom can reign. Everybody loves to see a case presented like the insider-exclusive investigative TV series produces its documentaries because it's much easier to understand and more powerful. We believe what we see. Rule number three, stories stir up emotions. This truth of storytelling is, not surprisingly, near and dear to my heart. Any good story doesn't just tell a jury or a judge that the other side is wrong, it shows it with vivid detail and images, the facts and circumstances involved, which evokes the desire to right a wrong. Rule number four, stories are the window in which we enter other people's lives and connect with them and discover our similarities. The hunger for story is ingrained in every human being. We humans seek and thrive on story to connect with our fellow man, pass down history, and to teach. Telling stories and being curious about the stories of others is a way of life as much as it is a technique of influence. In the courtroom, lawyers provide the words and the visuals show the jury or judge what happened and why it was wrong and why your side should prevail. Rule number five, stories have at least one moment of truth. The best stories show us something about how we should treat ourselves, others, or the world around us. No question about this. The best closing argument, the best presentation at a mediation, or the best discussion with opposing counsel summarizes a whole case in a simple description that encapsulates the right or wrong and highlights a larger truth. Rule number six, stories have a clear meaning. What is the case about? Can you answer that question in one concise sentence that connects on an emotional level and not only on a factual level? A case with a clear meaning is much more powerful than a case presented as a string of facts. A case is about a right or wrong and about the people involved. Every case has meaning that goes beyond the facts that create or defeat liability. Ask yourself, why does this matter? What's at stake and who is involved? Rule number seven, simple jury persuasion. Do slogans still work? Would, if it doesn't fit, you must acquit, still work? 
catchy slogans, phrases, and themes have long been the hallmark of a persuasive courtroom presentation, but new research throws a question on whether they are effective as we would like to think. The best trial lawyers that the Insider Exclusive have featured in its documentaries are the ones who knew when to stop talking. Sure, they seem to know what to say, but further, they know when it has been said. More is not necessarily better, too much information is overwhelming, and it is simply tuned out. What matters is that you K-I-S-S, -S, keep it simple, real simple. Rule number eight, in closing, treat your jurors as advocates. Remember, you aren't just persuading, you are persuading the persuaders. You aren't just influencing the decision maker, you are preparing the decision maker for subsequent discussions with the undecided. In addition to convincing the undecided jurors, you are also equipping the rest for the advocacy that will ensue during deliberations. Rule number nine, remember to give your champions both swords and shields. Closing arguments can and do turn favorable jurors into advocates, able to instrumentally use arguments on your behalf. Even for those jurors who have already decided or are strongly leaning as of closing arguments, your converts will still need both a sword and a shield in the upcoming deliberations. They'll need to be armed with good arguments, swords, and prepared to resist the arguments of jurors on the other side, shields. Finally, rule number 10. Remember that your jury is always smarter than your juror. Individual jurors can miss a lot, but the collective jury doesn't miss much at all. Ultimately, when you are persuading a jury, you are persuading a group, and that means aiming not just to convince, but to enable productive argument. As a trial lawyer and as a storyteller, lawyers practice a kind of magic, the most powerful magic on earth. You are myth makers and poets. And it is myth that consciously and subconsciously guides every human being on this planet for good or evil. Your words and the manner in which you use them may have enormous impact on individuals, communities, nations, the world, and world history. The ancient peoples of the world knew the power of the word. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, God created the heaven and the earth, not by waving a magic wand, but by speaking words. The ancients believed that your soul was your breath, that words created by breath came from your soul, from the immortal part of your being, hence they were sacred and powerful. The Gospel of John in the New Testament begins, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Indeed it was, and still is. Hi, I'm Steve Murphy, and this is the Insider Exclusive, live from Scotts Bluff, Nebraska, at the law offices of Robert Palkey Law Group. It is my great pleasure to introduce Bob Polky to the show. Welcome to the show, Bob. Thank you, Steve. Tell our audience a little bit about your firm, what type of law your firm practices. We're a small firm here in western Nebraska, and uh, essentially we're four attorneys, and we try cases uh, throughout the state of Nebraska, sometimes in uh, Colorado, Wyoming, Montana, um, various places throughout the region. This show that we're going to do today is kind of a very interesting show because what we are showing to the American public is how trial lawyers like yourself actually present a case to a jury. And the successful ones like yourself usually do that through the power of telling a story, right? Yes, sir. Um, you've had a number of cases where you can show us exactly how you related the power of the story to winning the case. I think the first one you mentioned is the Terry Stamen, is it? Correct. It's Terry Stamen case where there was an invisible injury involved. Tell our audience a little bit about that. Terry was a young man, a rancher from Crawford, Nebraska, worked for the Burlington Northern Railroad. He was in D&C building and he was exposed to diesel fumes, the byproducts of combustion, and also in the wheel touring room where they would true locomotive wheels. Smoke was created, and ultimately he developed occupational asthma. And that's what typically a corporation will call it, occupational asthma, although it's usually something much worse, right? 
Yeah, well, the uh, Burlington Northern wasn't very impressed <laughs> with his injuries, and uh, I ultimately got involved after another firm left the case, but uh, it was a major event and a major situation for Terry. What, did, what disease had he in contracted through his work? He, in fact, and it was diagnosed by uh, Lee Newman and Dennis Waite, both doctors at the time at National Jewish. Lee Newman was the director and Dennis was the previous director. And it was asthma caused by his workplace exposures. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, what were his injuries? He had difficulty breathing. Mm -hmm. And he could take air in and he couldn't get air out. And sometimes it was extremely frightening and he had to take medications, including steroids, some of which were powerful. Now, your jury came back with a million dollar verdict and that was your first million dollar verdict, wasn't it? Yes, it was a case where that was actually turned out to be a legal malpractice case. We had pursued that as far as we could against the railroad. We were concerned about a significant statute of limitations issue and then brought the case and treated it as a case within a case against the railroad. Now, some of your other cases where you were able to basically tell a story to the jury, uh, first of all, um, tell our audience, how do you develop a story to tell to the jury so that they can identify, grab hold of it, and develop empathy for your client? How do you do that? What you have to do is you have to walk a mile in your client's moccasins, walk in your client's shoes, go to their house, Every chance I get, I want to go to my client's house. I want to see how they live, what they live, what, they, what pictures they have on the wall. And in this case, I went to the doctor, the treating doctor, and I said, you know, this case doesn't have any broken bones. This doesn't have any x-rays. This doesn't have any of those things. How do we make this come alive? This is Lee Newman, National Jewish. And he said, let me think for a minute. And he said, you know, it's kind of like being on a boat in the water. Sometimes it's smooth as silk. Sometimes it's choppy, the one-foot waves, and sometimes it's like a tidal wave. Mm -hmm. That's what he has. Now, some, how about some of your other cases, like, for example, Tim Bacon? How did you tell the story to the jury so they could relate and have empathy for him? One of the things I did, I went to Tim's house, and I wanted to see his house. I wanted to see how he was able in his wheelchair to get around in his house. Mm -hmm. And in his house, he had a set of stairs and he couldn't get to the basement for a period of years. One, I, and I asked him, do you have tornadoes? And he said, yes. I said, tell me about that. And he said, well, one day my daughter called and she says, dad, you gotta get into the basement. And he says, yeah, how? And then at trial, we had a fight. The defense didn't think that they should be responsible, assuming there's any responsible, uh, responsibility for the cost of putting a means of getting down to the basement, you know, a track that would take him up and down, a lift that would take him up and down. Yeah. And um, I think that the jury understood and I think the jury was not very approving of their refusal to step up on that issue. Mm -hmm. And how about your case, the, uh, is it Carb Carbajal? Art Carbajal. Yes. One of the other things we've learned is, is that Sometimes doctors, in the case of Dr. Newman, just absolutely superb, but sometimes the best witness can be a nurse or a physical therapist. In that case, the question was, he had a facet joint injury, and the question was, how do you bring that alive? You know, no broken bones again, no uh, herniated disc. And so we talked to her and she said, he's in pain. Can you tell me what 10 out of 10 on your pain skill is? And she said, 10 out of 10 for me, is pain so severe, if it was in your arm, you would amputate it without an anesthetic to get rid of it. Did Mr. Carbajal have that kind of pain? Yes, he did. Mm -hmm. And then there was a, an effort by the defense counsel to discredit her a little bit. You know, he said he couldn't turn his neck. And she said, no, he couldn't turn his neck. In your record, you say, you know, According to him, he couldn't. And she said, no, he could not. And she won the credibility battle, hands down. Right, you've had some other, a couple of other cases, one which were familiar, 
the Richard Jameson case. Yes. How, do you, how, how did you relate the power of his story to the jury so they could come back with a just settlement, just verdict? In that case, we spent time with Richard in the hospital, in his home, and at his workplace. And he was severely burned. Severely burned, 65 to 70 percent of his body, second and third degree burns. And so at the end of the case, what we did is we said, assume the night before a man comes to Richard's house and he has an envelope and he sets it on the table and he says, this envelope is yours. All you have to do to own this envelope is get it from the chair, go over to the table and pick it up. But if you do, when you least expect it, when you're doing your job as you're told and as you're supposed to, all of a sudden, a meter that doesn't, uh, that has a strainer that doesn't strain, and a pump that doesn't pump, and then suddenly starts pumping, is going to cause gas to shoot all over you. You're going to be engulfed in flames, you're going to fall to your knees, and you're going to have, as part of your course, nightmares in the hospital where they scrape your flesh, your raw flesh, twice a day. You're going to have nightmares of dogs eating your flesh. So ladies and gentlemen, if there is five million, eight million, ten million in that envelope, would Richard pick it up and say, I accept, that's a fair trade? Would anybody? Yeah, that was very powerful. You had another case, uh, Lewandowski? Yes. What was that case all about? And how did you relate this story to the jury? Uh, Lauren Lewandowski uh, was about a 45-year-old road employee, one of the kindest, most jolly guys I ever knew. Mm -hmm. And one day he's working on this railroad bridge about 20, 25 feet up in the air. And all of a sudden, the surface, the decking that they have provided him fails. There's the failure on the part of the railroad. And the railroad uh, owned up, you know, were responsible. And then they tried to be not responsible on the other end, the, the damage end. And so we just said, uh, sort of in a similar fashion, you know, the day before, if someone comes to him and says, here's the envelope, and in this um, is something of value. Mm -hmm. And, but if you pick it up, here's what happens, and you're going to plummet about 18 to 25 feet, and you're going to see a tree as you're plummeting. And if you miss it, you think you're going to be paralyzed. If you hit it, you think you're going to be killed unless you're impaled. So what I try to do is listen to the client, understand their story, and share it in the present tense so that the people can have a glimpse, a, tip, a, a view of the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, one of the powerful things in any of these cases is letting the, your clients speak for themselves, right? Absolutely. Because um, these are stories all about people, everyday people, you, me, it could happen to anybody. And a lot of people never think it could happen to them until it does, right? That's one of the tragedies and, um, and uh, people like that and, you know, telling stories like this. And this is one of the reasons why I do it, so that people will be thinking about, you know, what do I need to protect myself? Yeah. Not only in the jury room, but in the voting box. Yeah. A lot of non-lawyers think that once you've made your present, your closing argument to the jury, then that's it. But really, there is two objectives when you're making your closing argument, because you know you are not going to convince everybody right then and there to vote for your client, to give your client what they deserve. You know there's going to be people against you, you know there's going to be people for you, and you know there's going to probably be a great majority of undecided people. So what do you arm your jurors with so that when they go back in the uh, deliberation room, that they, in essence, become kind of advocates for your cause? What do you give them? One of the things that I try and give them are powerful stories that they can relate to. I tell you facts, you tell me facts, and we soon forget. Yeah. But if I tell you a story that incorporates the facts, it allows the jury to hear it. And it allows it to hear it in a way where they're really listening. They're, 
they are focused on the story. I mean, you know, you and I watch Harry Potter. We know there's no Whomping Willow. We yeah. know there's no magical car. But we listen to the story because we get into the story because it's real. And every case that we're involved in is real. Somebody's hurt and it has real consequences. And we also like to arm them with courage. And we point out that we, we insist with our client that they step up to the plate. If they've done something wrong, own up, take responsibility. I mean, one of the things we're fed up with this country is people who don't take responsibility. And the defense so often wants to hide in the dugout. And we invite the jury, you know, this is an opportunity for you to make a choice. You're at the fork in the road. Stay with him in the dugout or step up to the plate. Invariably, over your 30-year career, have you always, for the most part, found jurors do step up to the plate if you tell the story right and the story is powerful enough? Do they step up to the plate and give justice to the person who's been injured? I have found that they've done it time and time again. And when I've been unsuccessful, I often take a look inward and ask myself, you know, what could I have done better? What should I have done better? And, you know, it's a learning process for everybody, myself included. But I have found, by and large, jurors are concerned about doing the right thing. And it's, not, it's very helpful that corporations try to remain in the dugout and not own up to responsibility, isn't it? <laughs> it's, and it's pretty predictable. Yeah, yeah. Listen, I want to thank you very much for being on this program. The information you've shared with us is invaluable, and thanks for taking your time to be with us today. Thanks for joining us. You can get more information about our guests and the issues at InsiderExclusive.com.